यूट्यूब दिखेगा यूट्यूब में सा ये ये Sir, sir, slides are showing. Just you have to uh, pin the slides uh, individually. Uh, 
individually like uh, from your side you have to pin the slides so that others don't change sir the slides are sharing sir slides are all shared uh, from your individual sir individually like uh, sir okay shanwa sir shanwa sir you just have to slides you have to to see fix the slides you have to pin now it's showing sir yes sir yes sir yes sir it is it, fine sir sharma sir you have to you have to just pin this you have to find it from the sidebar and then pin sir for individually sir तो उसमें फाउंड आ रहा है कि नहीं कैसे कर फाउंड आ रहा है हाँ फाउंड आ रहा है ये क्या बंद करना होगा ये आना चाहिए आएगा
सर सर लिंक तो दिया होगा सेकंड तो सर मने तार ते ओल के मने पिन को करीब वो पाना सर स्लाइड्स तो सर लिंक्स हम लोग का दिया होगा सर पूछा है सर सर ते ओ यूट्यूब लिंक को पैसे यूट्यूब पर सहायता से ते ओ सर Because they were selected under high input condition. There are plenty of fertilizer, water was there, quality we did not really bother, we just wanted enough food, not the high quality. So now these things are coming because of the people have become quality conscious, now we have enough food. So people are looking for the better quality, both processing, eating quality, nutritional quality, all those things people are looking for. And then because of the challenge of the global climate change, uh, Erratic rainfall, then temperature rise. Now we need to put these states also into the variety because they are highly sensitive to those things as they are not selected for those. They are only selected for high yield and their high input condition. So the wild relatives and traditional land races uh, of the crop plants here in case of this rice are their very rich source of uh, such genes. So once again you can see there in case of rice there are many there are not many, of course, but there are few, what we call mega varieties of rice, which are cultivated in more than 1 million hectares. For example, BR11, CR1009, IR64, Masuri, Swarna, Samba, Masuri, MTU, Tintin. There are some more, maybe one dozen or so or 20 varieties are there. If you see throughout the world, they are cultivated in very large area. And some of them are fairly old, some of them... Yeah, it takes some time to reach to 1 million hectare anyway. But they are very popular with the farmers, uh, because mainly because of their high yield and adaptability and reasonably good quality also. Then the traditional varieties there, they have very high level of stress tolerance and quality, but they are poor in economic performance. As a result, farmers are reluctant to grow these varieties. Now, may, many people say that the Green Revolution, because of the Green Revolution, we lost our all traditional variety. That is not a correct conclusion. We have not lost any one of them, only we have stopped growing them. All the traditional varieties are there in the gene bank uh, at 
TNB, PGR, and and at ERI. You can take any of these varieties which were grown 30 years, 40 years back, it is there. But nobody will grow them again because they have certain limitations. They are poor in there and so many other uh, limitations. So what is the, the correct path is that identify the genes which you have lost and put them back into high yielding background. How you do that uh, through marker assisted breeding, that process can be actually yeah, accelerated, as we all know. And then marker assisted breeding, there are many different types. The state pedigree type mass, mass selection is there. Marker assisted recurrent selection is there. Genomic selection we are talking about. And then one of the most successful one is the marker assisted by cross breeding. And several varieties have been released in globally and also in India through this process because it has several advantages. Uh, so we take a very well adapted mega variety of rice and then take a donor, whether it could be wild rice or it could be traditional land rice, which has a particular trait. And if we know that the you know, we have marked that trait uh, through QTL mapping or other kinds of thing, functional genomics, then it is even better because you can have the functional marker gene-based and you can do background selection, recombinant selection within two, three generations, you can get this. Uh, variety, which will be very similar to the original variety, which is a rare combination of genes. These mega varieties are a rare combination of genes. Uh, I can just tell you what is that rare combination. Suppose you take, uh, this year I have seen that uh, rice has 12 chromosomes, so 24 arms are there. So we can take one gene on each arm near the telomere. So they will recombine frequently in the Mendelian fashion, they will assert independently because there will be at least one recombination. So as a result, what, what will happen if these uh, 24 genes are segregating, each with two alleles, then that makes 16 million combinations of genes. And only one of those combinations is the original or mega variety, the Swarna. So you can see that and most of these combinations may be useless. So how you get rid of those combinations? by backcrossing. By every backcrossing, out of 60 million, we remove half 8 million, then 4 million, like that. So in two, three backcrosses, we eliminate most of the undesirable thing. And the, the percentage of undesirable types will be more, depending on the what is the background of this donor variety. If it is wild, then it is even more, even the traditional variety. So that's why most of the breeders, when they do the breeding, they cross elite with the elite. They cross good with the good so that there will be few, very few undesirable types. Otherwise, as soon as you start sourcing from the poor agronomic types, then you get a lot of these things and only way you can eliminate is the back cross breeding. Uh, so this is a standard procedure, but uh, through marker assisted breeding, this has worked, worked very, very successfully because rather than making seven, eight back classes in conventional breeding, back class breeding, you can do two, three back classes and very successfully eliminate I mean, most of the donor background and you can have 95%, more than 90% background recovery. So you, you have the for new product like the original variety with the added trait. And this example is here, is this Swarna sub one. Uh, most of the rice breeders, they know about this thing. So the donor was identified in 1970, then breeding lines were developed and mapping, etc. But the gene was cloned, the sub gene, in 2006 after the availability of the rice genome information. And then within three years, by marker assisted back crossing, which I just described, the product was developed, what is called Swarna sub and released in India in 2009. And now it covers a fairly good area and is tolerant to two weeks of complete submergence. Then we also have IR64, Samba, Masuri, BR11. Globally, there are a number of varieties which have been developed through this, following this approach. So I'm not going into detail. Uh, at our institute, um, after completing the rice genome, we, we developed a chip also, high density chip of rice. And this, this has been patent, has been granted on this chip. This is the unique thing about this chip is that this is totally gene-based chip. It is not the, most of the other chips, they have the genome-based because mostly they are based on the 
and non-coding uh, stuff because uh, based on the repeats and through the genome. And they have one SMP at each locus. And this chip is gene-based and it has multiple SMP per gene. So as a result, we can get the haplotype information or allele information. Suppose a gene has 10 SMPs in this chip, then those 10 SMP can make, you know, 10, 12, or sometimes 15 different haplotypes, which is the alleles. So then one can also get a gene-based association, which allele is associated, not only which locus is associated. Those additional information we can get. And this chip includes genome-wide markers based on the single copy genes, and all the clone genes, economically important, some nearly 200 have been included. And uh, in the similar chips we have made in pigeon pea or mango, also the disease resistant genes have also been included. So this chip is very useful for doing both foreground, background, recombinant, all kinds of selection, and association mapping, QTL mapping, and many papers have been published using this one now. And we use this one to analyze the background recovery in the lines developed by ERI, which way background selection was done using the low density SSR markers, maybe two to three markers per chromosome. Then when we analyze using this high density 50K chip, then we find that uh, there is actually variation in the background recovery. For example, Solna Saban has got 97% recovery, but Samba Masuri has got only 79% recovery. So this, this has an effect on the final performance of the variety. For example, Samba Masuri Sabuan is very, very different from the original Samba Masuri. Sometimes these differences could be crucial if it affects the quality or traceability or some other property of the variety. So to, in order to be sure the, to harness the versatility of the original mega variety, we should try to recover you know, as much as possible. So that's why Swarna Sabuan is quite successful uh, as compared to Samba Masuri Sabuan or even other Sabuan. So, we developed this program based on the same theme, funded by the DBT, where Assam Agriculture University is also a partner. Now it is running in the second phase. It involved 15 different institutions, mostly from the eastern part of the country, where we have this rain fed uh, rice is more, and this uh, subject to, uh, prone to this uh, drought, flood, salinity problems. And we have already developed uh, uh, four varieties have been already released and notified. The number of them are in the pipeline, some are at ABT2. So we expect to develop about a dozen varieties through this program. And it is already uh, undergoing. So I'm not going into detail here. What we are trying to do, we are trying to transfer the major QTLs for drought talents and combine it with the submergence talents and salt talents. So individually and also in the second page, we are trying to uh, pyramid multiple QTS. I will show you some result. Basically, the approach is that it just have two to three back classes to recover the background. And we can analyze a larger number of lines and do phenotypic background selection first and then narrow down some lines which are looking very similar to the recipient parent, but they do have the uh, the peak marker and the recombinant selection. Uh, and then from the out of that, we apply this chip to select the lines which have more than 95% recovery. And this is the uh, procedure we have followed. Now, one more uh, gene we identified for the yield uh, using the same approach and we transferred into 12 different mega varieties of rice. This gene is on chromosome 4, long arm. And you can see in every background, it increased the size of the pen kill very much. In Samba Masuri, it increased 150 grains per pen kill. And the yield improvement is nearly 10 to 15 percent. So these are also in the testing stage. They can be released as a nil as such. Uh, but of course, one has to combine it with other traits because the breeding is where you have to take good genes from different sources and put into one high yielding background. So sometimes you may have one gene but lacking something else, so it may not be the best variety. So idea is to uh, combine as many good genes as possible along with the high yield. So this gene is very, very useful, which was found in one of the Indica Japonica classes, uh, developed at e uh, IRI, but it was a breeding line, not a variety. And now we have put this gene into many varieties and it's performing 
very well. This is one example where we put it into um, this famous Pusa 1121 Basmati variety with more than 97% recovery. And the yield is more than 10% higher than this thing. Now let us come to this collection part here. Um, and then through my national professor project, the objective was to collect wild rice from different uh, habitats in India and then map the QTLs and do a little mining and transfer them into cultivated background. So the wild rice here, you can see here, this, uh, these are the black in color and they are very long arms. And they are growing, I will show you some habitats. They look very healthy and they grow into, nobody takes care of them, they take care of themselves. Because the, for farmers it is weed, okay? Farmers want to get rid of it. They don't want in their field. Sometimes they are very much troubled with this thing. How to get rid of it? Because it, actually it is very vigorous and resilient to so many things. And it has uneven maturity and the settling property. Uh, it has learned how to survive uh, in the opposition of human being and also the nature. And because it has some, it must have many good genes. So that was the idea to harness this resource. So there are total 25 uh, species of uh, rice, which we can say wild rice, in addition to the two cultivated one, which is Oraja sativa, the Asian wild, Asian cultivated rice, and Oraja glabrima, which is the African cultivated rice. You can see here the, the uh, lower side. This has got the very a red color panel in this arms. So this is what called the rupee program. No, red, red on. And you can see there are white ones also, there's a lot of variation, but see, typically the wild rice you can identify with black seed in uneven maturity. It's such as as you touch it, you cannot harvest it. So we have collected a large number of that. This is called Oraja Nivara also, the annual type, and the perennial one is called Oraja rupee program. But this is just one species complex. So, uh, now I will just show you the, some of the habitats from which you are collected. Uh, see, these, these are the habitats where, where it is in abundant quantity. Just like uh, in the rural side, in the, in the eastern states like in UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, even in Assam, the road side, you know, a, uh, the government leaves some 120 feet from the center of the road either side. And this is actually a good habitat, that's where it is conserved. It is not found in the rice field because farmers get rid of it. So it will be present in some uncultivated land. Uh, only in the farmer's field, only when it has failed to control the weeds. Now there, there are some lot of shallow ponds are there near the rivers, which are called tals or um, these kind of things. And <clears throat> you can see here the tribal people tie them up actually in the north, so they prevent it from settling and they can harvest it and they sell it for people use this rice for fasting. It has got different names in different parts of country. I I know at least 15 names of this. Different different names in different parts of the country. Then the shallow ponds you can see here in Aurangabad in Bihar, this is in UP here. Then <laughs> at Dhemaji in the river basin, I collected last to last year. Again, in the lowland area. So, there are some area where it is plenty. <clears throat> now, there are habitats where it is rare, but it is very important. Mostly the upland habitats. You can see in the Himachal Pradesh, in the hills, then in this Jharkhand here, near Rachi, there are shallow, small, small pits are there, and around that wild rice is growing. Then in the Dhamtari forest in Jharkhand, in Chhattisgarh, rather. You can see it is there. Then Western Ghat in Karnataka, in the Ubali River, across the Ghats, you can see the lot of wild rice is there. So, so these are very small packets, but it is spread throughout the India, both upland and lowland. Now the third kind of habitat I am telling you, it is very well adapted to different kinds of stress situation. Like see, in the now district here, which is the very Sodic land and it is growing on there. Then there is a uh, coastal salinity in Karwar in Karnataka. The sea water comes in and the, this is thriving here. This is the wild rice. Then uh, flooding in Kaimur in Bihar here. The, the whole water is flooded and then 
Why just just go there is not dying. And also in the drought, like in Mirja Pushon, but everything is dried, but this bears the seed. So it is adapted to certain uh, wild rice is adapted to different kinds of stress situation. And these are the potential source of genes there. They must have the genes. Now the last one is the threatened habitat. What I call you that it is depleting very fast. Why it is depleting? Because the both the farmers and the development are the enemies of this. The farmers are not the friend of wild rice. They don't want it actually. For them it is a weed. For scientists it is the source of gene, but not for the farmers. Every time I go to collect it, they say, Oh, sahab, ab isko aaye hain, kaise isko khatam karna hai? Hain ka ki, uh, hum isko collect kar rahe hain, because they have gene, because they survive, they apne aap survive karta hai, to isme achche achche genes honge, jis ke liye variety mein use kar sakte hain. Then they get disappointed, because they want to get rid of it. And then the other is the development, there is some school is building is coming up, some industrial park, this has been earmarked by the Chhattisgarh government in the new Raipur. Then you have this in particular in broadening of the road. I showed you the roadside is one of the major habitats, but then when the road is broadened, this habitat is finished. So the wild rice also finished along with it. So the development is the enemy number of one. For not only wild rice, for all kinds of biodiversity, development is universally proportional to the preservation of biodiversity, which is unfortunate because we have to do development also, but we should encourage as little as possible on the natural habitats so that we can preserve our biodiversity. And you can see this is a residential area here. I found more wild rice in the residential area, which some part is earmarked for making the residential flats, but I am 100% sure that once this flat is made, the wild rice will not be there, but now it is going it very happily. So it has all round pressure from farmers as a weed to be got rid of, then from the development agencies, they want to find some fellow land where they can make some building or something. So these are all the pressures are there. And these, these have the genes which have evolved through millions of years, but we are losing them in, in very fast. So this is the timely I have collected about 800 of them. Uh, from India has got uh, 16, I think, agroclimatic zones. I have collected from 11 of them. Something like Rajasthan and other things uh, I have left. Uh, I, hopefully I can collect some more if it's possible. Then uh, I have grown it at IRI then characterized at morphological level, all the variability you can see. And I was surprised that it, most of them actually, and they bear fruit even at higher end, even though I collected from different parts of the country. They are very resilient. And then we have used this chip which I described you, the rice chip, and we have characterized them uh, with that. And through that characterization, a new thing came actually that uh, the, our Indian variety, particularly Aus and Indica type, they have evolved from the Indian wild rice, because when you do the phylogenetic analysis, our varieties are nested inside the our wild rice. Um, they are, that means they are more related to, more closer to our wild rice than to the other groups of rice, like Japonica and other rice. So this, this proves beyond doubt that they have evolved locally, so the rice has got polyphyletic origin, mostly in the northeast of, you know, India, where the maximum diversity is there in the Assam region and the eastern India. Uh, we have selected the rice, traditional farmers, particularly our type is 100% sure that there is no other country, the house varieties are there. And house closely related wild rice is also in India. Uh, and this is more widely spread. So um, this came at a time when uh, the Chinese scientists were claiming that all rice has originated in China and they published paper in Nature and PNAS and people had started believing that for a few years. Then when we published that, then again uh, a group of scientists, there are two, three different groups of scientists, some of them reanalyzed the Chinese data also to show that their analysis was wrong and rice in fact have at least three different origins. One is of course in South China, Southeast Asia to be more precise. Then one is in the Southeast Asia here, uh, near the Indo-Burmese region. The other one is the Indian subcontinent, particularly Aarhus, Indica, and Japan. This is the way the rice has been domesticated. And this information came from the 
collection of large number of wild rice and looking at that relationship with the cultivated rice this became very clear using the high density uh, genomic tools so the ancestry of the domesticated rice was established and in the same way now uh, we characterize them there are three different sub population the aus type is in the green color the indica we call pro aus pro indica and then there is a mid gangetic plane uh, this blue and it is very special because it is not related to any cultivated rice and there is a lot of that is there and the tribal farmers harvest them and use them so this is a very good source of it is classable with the easily classable with the cultivated rice and then we have done detailed characterization you know based on the morphological taxonomic traits then p sign one ecotype markers then snp structure ssr structure we we have uh, characterized in different way we, the, we found that the molecular level there are three sub populations are there that is pro indica pro aus and mid gangetic so i'm not going into detail these, these things have been published and um, database has been developed this has also been published and then we have developed the species specific markers based on the chloroplast genome of these species because it is very important to characterize the species at the molecular level with certainty that whether it is rupee pogan or nivara or which species sometimes based on morphological is quite confusing even with the marker like sign one markers it was a lot of overlapping results were coming but based on the chloroplast genome which is mutates much less we got very good result we have the indel markers and the snp markers uh, these are the snp here we found private snp that means snp will be present only one particular species and we also had the indel markers so i'm not going into detail with the shortage of time uh, now we have the kavita tripathi she developed these markers she has completed her phd now we have the markers with which we can tell which species is that which species of rice because just looking at the morphologically you can get con conflicting and confusing results these are some of the examples of the indel markers see all the here a genome have got this size of the band the other genomes have different kinds of band so a combination of indel markers or snp markers can you tell you with the certainty that which species of wild rice it is what i have collected is mostly is varaja uh, rupee pogan and nivara now then we have screened it here to find the in the uh, in this kind of red out shelter we grow and then identify the lines which are highly talent to draw of course we always get a range of response by anything you screen from very highly susceptible to highly talent this range is much much bigger than what you have in the cultivated Similarly, for the germination, we found line which got more than 90-95 percent germination compared to the standard control like Kalamchi and Nani, which have only 60-70 percent germination. Of course, something like IR64 and Swarna, there will be no germination. If you put them in 15 centimeter of water and ask them to germinate, there will be zero germination because they cannot survive the anoxia or lack of oxygen. then we identify new sources of the flooding talents also and then one can go to the trade mill the way the fr13 sub1 was discovered we are now going we are midway through to find if we can have some other new genes different genes other than sub1 that is the idea so these are the lines which you know after 18 days of complete submerging they they have the be um, the fruit and the panicles Then we identify the two lines which are more tolerant to salinity than the pokhali. Pokhali has a score of three, but these lines have a score of one. And then BLB, you can see we found several lines. The thirteen lines were highly resistant; they are immune. Now this is genetic has to be worked out. So then similarly for the seed blight, we have found lines, and one of the scientists, the published, he has made already the population is mapping. So with bad cross breeding. mapping and transfer at the same time then last year we had lot of infestation with brown spot disease uh, we have planted 700 of our wild rice at irin most of them were infected heavily with this brown spot but there were some certain lines which were highly tolerant 
So again, for any trait we have a screen, we found the lines which are both the stream, more susceptible than the cultivated and more tolerant than the cultivated. So this is definitely going to give us a new genes, but there is a process for that. We have to map it and then find map it and try to identify the gene behind it, or at least have the QTL which you can transfer. Now we did this one example I am showing you that one of the salt talent lines which was collected from Mandi district of Himachal Pradesh because there are salty hills are there and it, it grows there so this was better than Pokhali. And then we made backcross one, in the backcross one yap one we isolated the DNA and analyzed to the 50k chip and backcross one yap two which is analogous to yap two derived yap three. We did the phenotyping at seedling stage as well as reproductive stage. So you can see it is a backcast population. So we look for the marker which segregate one is to one. And this uh, uh, out of 50,000 SNP, we found some 1100, 1200 which behave like this. And they were, they were used for the making the map. This is high density enough map to make any QTL mapping. So you don't have to do polymorphism survey then analysis. In one go, you have everything. Polymorphism survey also there, genotyping is also there, and you can select the markers which fit the one is to one ratio and discard the rest. So this way, uh, genotyping was done, you get sort of normal distribution. Here you can see these are the IR64 totally sensitive, then NKSWR173, which is tolerant, then Pokali is also tolerant, but less tolerant than this one. So th this way it was screened. Then phenotyping of the grains and plant traits at the reproductive stage also it was done. And we identified a number of QTLs for both the seedling stage as well as reproductive stage. Here you can see those which were contributed by wild rice are given in red. So this is one near the saltal locus, then chromosome 3, chromosome 4, chromosome 11. Some major QTLs were identified, they contributing more than 15% to the uh, final trade value. Then uh, IR64 also had several QTLs. You can only tell them when you pass with the contrasting one. So this wild rice was contrast with IR64. So all these mega variety which we have, they have a lot of good genes we don't even know. We just take it for granted. You will only know when you cross it with a sensitive one, then you will know how many good genes and QTL it has. So this was actually a quite revealing that it has at least three, four different uh, QTLs for salt talents. Then what are the genes in those regions? Also we know uh, we have the complete genome map and we can zoom in and find map these things. So that's where we are at this step here. Similarly, QTL for anaerobic germination, we identified a major QTL on chromosome 7 in two different populations. Um, one is the NKSWR70 and then same approach using the uh, BC1, F1, F2 population, F1 for making the map and F2 for phenotyping. We have got major QTL on chromosome 7, uh, which explains some up to 28% of the variation. So we are mobilizing these into the uh, basmat, uh, this uh, high yielding variety. You can see this is the major QTL with very high large score on chromosome 7. And then underlying genes are similarly, we have tried to find out. Then the last one is the allele mining for abiotic stress talents. We know the large number of genes which are for doubt talents, salt talents, many candidate genes are known, like DEV1, DEV1, yeah. So we, we amplified and sequenced for a large number of these wild rice succession and we found associations. Some of the alleles were associated with the and our talents, but that has to be checked in the segregating population. Similarly, uh, in the SKT transporters, large number of transporter genes are there. We identified certain alleles which are highly associated, and this work is published, both in the lion races as well as in the wild rice. Then we collected some uh, flood uh, talent rice. There was a panel of uh, uh, some more than 100 lines from ED and from India, and we identified uh, here lines. Uh, these were 32 lines which were consistently very tolerant to submergence, and only 18 of them, actually these bold ones, they don't have the sub-1G. 
They have uh, submergence talent due to some other genes. So the new sources have been identified. Now, if you want to get to the gene again, one has to make bioparental population and merge them. And the lot of publications I just showed you also, they have come through this world of the wild rice exploration and mapping and utilization. So this is about 10 years work. And I have got the extension of the project by another three years. So hopefully we will be adding to this thing some more. And expected our impact on agriculture will be that one thing we are conserving these wild rice resources. We try to do some in situ conservation also through state biodiversity boards. Then uh, integration lines we are developing. And we, what we like to see is something like this, where through the QTLT variety project, these are the four variety DRR50, which had got DTY and suburban genes. Then we have got this uh, Ranjit Sabwan and Bahadur Sabwan, which were developed uh, by Assam Agriculture University, where we collaborated. Similarly, the uh, Subhas Swarna Sabwan with the two QTLs have been released by uh, CRRI. DRR then was released by the RIRR. So we have collaborated, and then the, some eight varieties are already in the pipeline. They will be coming soon. Some this year, some maybe next year. So we like to see the product of this thing go into. So this DRR than 50 is actually an improved version of Samba Masuri, which has got both flood and drought talent. And just two years back, there was a drought-like situation in, in UP and Bihar. And this variety yielded up to five tons, just simply with uh, one life-saving irrigation. So this, this is the kind of uh, product we want to come up with, uh, using the genes uh, from the wild rice. Which has many of such, uh, which has many such genes as we, we can tell as we have a screen, but it will take time to develop and people need to share. You are all welcome to share this material. Uh, if you want any of them, I can give you the seeds and you can follow, you can make use of this thing to the gene discovery and also the deployment. So, we, all this, I will thank you all for your kind attention. And if you have any question, I will be very happy to answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir, for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you can put off your slides now, I think, then that will be better for uh, discussion. So, uh, yes, so thanks a lot, sir, uh, for excellent presentation. And then, you know, I must uh, highly appreciate that for your uh, big contribution to the society. Uh, uh, before uh, I request others to ask question, maybe you know I have uh, one or two queries. Have you ever tested the wild rice? Any any wild rice can it can they be tested? Yes, yes, I, I have tested. They are very very tasty actually. This oh. is very difficult to get enough and make enough rice. This is rice which tribes make from that, which they collect by you know uh, by tying them up or in this. Uh, every day morning they will go and they will collect like this, eh? like uh -huh. harvesting every day. And they they sell it to up to 200, 300 rupees per kg. People use oh. it in, when they are fasting. So this okay. is not uh, this is not considered as a grain because it is not cultivated. So it is okay. just like considered as a fruit from the forest. Because okay. there is no flower okay. and gone into that. So are they, they sticky? Into, are they sticky or they are non-sticky? Uh, they are not non-sticky. Uh, okay, they're non-sticky. Uh, yeah, and when you, yeah, when you look for a different, you know, stress tolerance in the wild rice, have you looked for insect resistance? Because normally in legumes also we have found like, you know, insect resistance, you know, they are not very much insect resistant, but uh, otherwise they have many other, you know, good traits, agronomic traits. Yeah, but we have you looked for this? Seen, we have not seen for this. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, this could be an important maybe aspect. Can be yeah. Done. Yes. Again, some other moves, yes. Yes. So uh, I, I, we expect a lot of questions from the uh, other uh, viewers. Please. Uh, can I have one? Yeah. Dr. Mukherjee, please. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, have, you, have you looked into the microRNA profile of this wild rice? No, sir. We haven't looked at We haven't looked at it. Like you are in it. Like, I can tell you to look at it. 
Actually, Dr. Rodwin from uh, Yuna University, he has sequenced the representative wild rice from complete genome. Uh, so there one can also look at the sequence is already available, here we can look for that in there. And also we can do of course micro RNA type sequence. I think we have seen the micro RNA can be predicted from the sequence, but it is better to yes, see all the NGH experiments to complement with that. Yes, sure. I think that this kind of work has not been done to isolate micro RNA and sequence things. Okay. Uh, Roman is having a question, I think. Roman? Yes, sir, I have a question. Since sir, you have given a very nice the, the, the discussion, so I have a question that suppose there are three ill QTLs that has been pyramided into one variety. Same variety I am using in my back cross generations to transfer to my variety. Is it possible to transfer the same three ill QTL in different chromosomes in one generation of back crossing? That is to using SSR marker. One generation might be difficult because uh, at least two by classes I think should be given. And then if you have a large number of uh, lines, then from there one can select with, with the sufficient background recovery. That is also the QTS using SSR marker. Thing is that how big size should be the population? Any other, any rough ideas? See, get all the QTS in one generation of back cross. <laughs> yeah, that's a very tough question because people have not done like this Pusa Basmati one which was developed uh, the first this variety, it was developed with one back class only. Uh, which was transferring these uh, two genes, let's say 13 and let's say 21, but the background recovery eventually was only about 85%. And so it has certain deficiency. So, if you want to really develop nil, I think at least two back classes is recommended. And uh, I will suggest that instead of using SSR marker, we should use high density markers. In initially, you do phenotypic selection, simply compare with your recipient parent. We, we need not to do this background selection <coughs> uh, through the initial back classes because already we know that the recovery is very fast, even without selection. And you can do phenotypic selection, look for the plants which are looking very similar to the recipient. And then uh, those selected plants, you can apply this high density chip. And then uh, that allows you to further 10, 15%, which is not visible to the naked eye. But two chips, you can find lines which have got the highest level of background recovery. This is the one which we are following. After two back classes, sometimes we are getting the success. And if we don't have, then we make one more back class. But in, in one back class, it will be quite difficult, and even with SSR marker, which is low density, so we miss out on some regions. As I showed you the example of the Erie sub one lines, there is nearly 10% variation there. Not only 10, more than 15% variation is there, where they use only SSR for background analysis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, there are some questions in the chat box, but you know, I request students. To ask directly, you know, why don't you ask directly? That will that will be another another experience, you know. You should ask directly, students. Sir, this is Dr. Modi. Uh, okay, yeah. sorry. Very very detailed talk about uh, the resources that is available in our wild rice, and this is diminishing uh, fast, very fast. Sir, I like that your comment about. Uh, that there are a lot of important genes in the mega varieties that we just uh, take uh, for granted. Actually, when we made this Ranjit into Banglami cross that you know about, when we were doing the QTL analysis, we found a lot of QTLs in the, uh, from Ranjit also, for this uh, uh, abiotic stress uh, tolerance. And in one uh, year, it shows that for at least early generation, Ranjit early. Uh, uh, Sibling stage, Ranjit has good top tolerance also. So, yeah, this, this I, agree, I, I agree with you 100%. Because you see, so far, through even ECRIPT, central ECRIPT trials, mm -hmm. we have released more than 1500 varieties of rice. But how many of them are cultivated by farmers? How many of them are popular? 
hardly 30 40 of them so these are those which have turned out to be mega variety they are really rare combination and they have so many good genes for adaptability we as we say we take it for granted or we don't know what are those genes you will only know when you class it with something and you don't find anything better than that <laughs> then you know it is a particular not only the genes but the combination is even more important all these good alleles are there in one background so that's what make this variety highly adaptable and highly high yielding so uh, i think this is a good one of the approaches not the entirely this is the only way if we want to just something is missing some susceptibility we can transfer this way to by cross breeding so this is one very well known method of breeding but to develop the nils actually there are some question i can see here that have you observed the performance differences and instability in the wild collection during experiments uh, in plots after removing from the original inhabitants actually this is a very important question and uh, very difficult to assess this thing because when we grow them at IRI or some other things, uh, one of the bigger challenges is that you see, what I collect is actually a mixture of type. Even from one place I take 200, 100 seeds. When I grow them, already there is a lot of variation within that. And then when we grow them and again select from there, we, one of the biggest problems is that we try to move towards more towards intermediate. Because uh, totally, which are totally wild, they are difficult to maintain. They start settling and they uh, managing them. We have to put in this mosquito net and all those things. So we then collect and then bulk it again. But initially, what we were doing, we were taking one plant to make the pure culture and the bulking the rest. So we have single plant harvest and the, the bulk of the whole thing. So single plant one slowly it shifted towards more, uh, you know, naturally we get these plants which give more seeds. So it is very difficult to tell what difference was there from the original thing because we cannot compare it directly. But one thing I can say definitely all of them uh, flowered here at IRI, which was surprising. They are so well adapted that you can take anywhere they will flower. But and then uh, these traits were maintained, like stress tolerance. We found several lines. So, strictly, I cannot tell that what difference was there because initial population was also a mixture of type. Then, when we plant here again, we are mixture. So, I have ended up changing my strategy that rather than uh, trying to purify it. difficult to grow, we, we keep the square plots and then harvest them and put them all together in a black. So there, there will be definitely some genetic drift will be there, selection will be there. So there are a lot of unknowns are there. It is very much similar to maintaining this mutant population. If you, if you take one mutant in M2 and there are so many mutations, it's not a single mutation. So our in N22 uh, mutation project also, they are following the same thing. They are not trying to purify it. They just keep on bulking. So it's a very complex situation and difficult to answer really your question that uh, we haven't done such kind of experiment to strictly compare that what we lose uh, when we're taking them out of their natural habitats. Definitely all the genes we don't lose uh, because we screen them and select them and try to identify it. But there will be a lot of differences from environment to environment, I'm sure. Other question? Other question? Yes, Dr. Singh? Any yes, hand? somebody, yes, please. So, you wonderful presentation. First of all, I like to congratulate you. And you mentioned about the some salt tolerant variety from Himachal Pradesh, isn't yes. it? Yes. Some saline rock area you mentioned. Uh, this is wild rice. Huh? Well, yeah. yes. So, how they are different from the lines in the coastal area or Pokali or the other coastal? Uh, Actually, we haven't uh, studied the mechanism yet, but we, the QTL is different, it's on different chromosome. So, we will be doing those studies now. Once we nail down to the gene, then we see what mechanism it has. It looks like some kind of transporters. 
in those regions there were some candidate genes which are like transporters so we haven't gone to that much details uh, so far and uh, how much uh, sodium or uh, potassium they this is the 150 millimolar uh, sodium chloride was given at the seedling stage okay thank you uh, there is one more question here from sandani uh, can you share your opinion on the role of sub one c gene and the submergent stallings uh, i think this is very interesting question because I just showed you some uh, slides towards the end here when we try to correlate the polymorphism in sub one A, B, and C with the level of tolerance. In fact, we found better correlation, better association rather with the sub one C than sub one A. There were so many exceptions to the sub one A gene, but with the sub one C there were fewer exceptions. So this is quite wide open that sub one C may have a role. See all the sub one variety which we have developed, including Swarna sub one, it has all the three genes, sub one A, B, and C. Because when you transfer a QTL, we are not transferring a single gene; we are transferring a chunk, maybe about one MB. I have done analysis; we are transferring some one up to one to five MB in this variety. So they have several genes, and definitely all the three sub ones, A, B, and C, all three are J there, and. I have a feeling actually sub one C is very important. Uh, actually, we have to do proper design experiment to find the rare recombinant between sub one A and sub one C, and then then prove it that whether it is due to sub one A or sub one C. I have a doubt about the original conclusion also, which tells us that it is sub one A, but I, at the moment I cannot tell you with certainty. But your your doubt is actually right. The sub one C definitely could be very very crucial here because functionally it is the same thing. What sub one A codes, sub one C codes the same thing. Only is the allelic differences which are important. So let us see. We we are planning some history. Uh, I think you are also getting certain exceptions. I uh, during my review in your center, I I noticed. I think Dr. Modi can tell. There are certain varieties uh, which don't have the sub one A, but they are very tolerant, and it could easily be due to sub one C or, or some other genes also. Uh, so I don't rule out the role of sub one C in even in the sub one variety which has been released. Okay, good, Sandani, good, thank you, Dr. Modi. Any comment on this? No, no, Whatever he... what Dr. Singh is saying, I also thought that uh, sub one C might have uh, some major role to play. But we are going ahead with the experiments. We cannot say anything at this moment. We have to find the combinations between sub one A and sub one C, which is possible, but it is rare. So, yes, in the larger population, I scanned all the literature. There are only one or two combinations are there. So, in a planned way, we can actually prove or disprove this thing. We'll come back to you and discuss with you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? From students or from faculties. Uh, if not, then once again thank you very much for this excellent presentation and for being with us thank for you this webinar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was uh, really I'm grateful to you for this uh, nice presentation. You know, which definitely will benefit our scientists as well as students. Thank you very much. Thank so you. here, yeah, we end up, and the next, uh, I think we are going to meet on.